every time there is a school shooting or a mass shooting as just defined by the FBI, and I work with law enforcement a lot, one of the things I get asked frequently when there are these tragic events is whether or not we can predict and why we don't predict who these shooters are going to be. And the answer I always give to people is, I wish we could, but we can't. We don't have the screening devices. We don't have the psychiatric test, the psychometric test, the psychological screening devices that differentiate who is going to do something like this versus who is not. Now, there are some things we'll talk about in a minute that tell us more than most people probably know, but we simply can't give someone a psychological profile of who's going to pull the trigger in a school or a crowded venue or not. But your approach is really not about that. It's about reaching out to these people who may self-identify or come to the attention of authorities or the helping profession in some way and giving them an alternative route to take as opposed to doing that tragic event, you've worked on ways to reach out and give them an alternative route to take, correct? That is true. And, and, um, and we're also shortening that distance between support and interventions that you can have for an individual who's identified and being able to identify an individual. And as I'm sure you know very well, um, the FBI's Behavioral uh, Analysis Unit and the Secret Service have uh, together made dramatic strides over the last few years in coming up with a set of uh, defined circumstances uh, that are common to many mass shooters and and could be applied to just about any uh, murderer. And that list, at the top of that list, Dr. Phil, is a grievance. And what that means is to say is that a perception by an individual that they've been mistreated or wronged or treated unjustly in some way, that is the probably the number one common factor for most forms of violence and most forms of gun violence that isn't the gun itself. And what my research focuses on is what is it about a grievance that transforms somebody from a good person into a killer? Uh, And we've made great strides in that area through neuroscience and behavioral studies. Let me ask you something, though, and I'm really doing this because I know you have some good answers to this, so I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. And some of it we don't have answers for, but some of it you do. Isn't some of that analysis, though, post hoc? And by that, I mean, you're right. When we look at the FBI's behavioral analysis group, we look at the profilers, we do know that these are mostly males almost exclusively males. We know that they're young. We know that they are marginalized in some way, that they've maybe been through a breakup or lost a loved one in some way, that they have some life event that they consider themselves to have been victimized, rejected in some fashion. So those that pull the trigger, that's true of, but everybody that experiences that doesn't pull the trigger. So it's not predictive. Right. And what I would say is that it's partially predictive. So it's a piece of the puzzle and there are perhaps 10 or more factors that you need to add to that. For instance, somebody who has a grievance and who's stockpiling weapons and who has already begun his planning process and has been holding this grievance for a long period of time isn't letting it go. When you start to add those factors, you can start to narrow down to a person that needs some form of help and support before they go and commit that act of violence. But it's not a nice and tidy business. It's not a, uh, you know, you can't spend five minutes and go, now there is somebody that's ready to kill and the rest of the people we can exclude. But I think more important uh, is what the FBI and Secret Service are missing. um, And that's the piece of, of the puzzle that we've been able to provide, which is what happens when somebody has a grievance and what 
neuroscience, recent neuroscience brain imaging fMRI studies are showing is that a grievance triggers a craving in the brain for retaliation, for justice in the form of revenge. That is the new insight that uh, science is bringing to the picture that's showing that grievance triggering retaliation triggers a desire for revenge, for pleasure, for hedonic reward. In other words, the human brain on revenge looks almost identical to the human brain on drugs. That's an important piece. And we can then, if we know people have a grievance and know that they're developing a, an addictive grieving, grievance uh, craving process, we have methods we're developing now to intervene with that individual and take them out of that addiction and break the craving before they act on it in the real world. So if this craving is getting into the limbic system and hijacking the pleasure centers, if it's getting into a loop that can be disrupted, then you're saying that if you can disrupt the craving, then you can disrupt the behavior that satisfies the craving. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yes. I mean, you think about it this way to try and visualize it and make it, make it, uh, help it make sense for you know, your listeners is there's a courtroom inside every human mind. Every human mind has a courtroom in it, you know, and everything's there. There's, you know, a judge's bench and there's a table for the prosecution and a table for the defense and a witness stand. And inside of this courtroom, uh, this is where we put on trial the people who offend, wrong, betray, humiliate us. And we do this, humans do this, billions of times a second around the world all day, every day, because we're always running into things that offend or hurt us or victimize us, or that we imagine offend, hurt, or victimize us. Because this is the extra danger to this, is that it can just be in your imagination. There's no universal judge that says, oh, your, your offense, yeah, that's, that's valid, and this other one isn't, and since we think it's not, you don't carry it anymore. If it's real for you, it's real. And what happens is, is that in this courtroom, you, the individual, the victim, play all the roles. You're the prosecutor, you're the victim, you're the defendant, you're the judge, you're the jury, and sometimes you're the executioner. And what that means is it leaves you with a decision. This trial is happening inside your mind, but at the end of the trial, you're going to decide, are you going to carry out that sentence in flesh and blood in the here and now, or are you going to let it go? That's a critical moment, and that's why I've sort of become a lawyer in, who, who I practice law inside the courtroom of the mind now, not uh, only in real courtrooms, because that's where it's all happening before it turns into violence. Well, I want to spend a moment on what you're talking about here, because I want our listeners and viewers to think about this in their own life. They've heard me say a million times that perception is reality. We tend to believe ourselves what we tell ourselves. And I've used the example, if I put a blindfold on someone and walk them around and they believe that the next step they take is off the edge of a 10-story building, they'll fight you like you were trying to put a cat in a sack if you're trying to get them to take that next step, right? They can be on a flat floor in the middle of a room, but if they believe that next step is going to take them off the ledge of a building. They'll fight you for their life, even though reality is different. If they believe it, it's true for them. And that's what you're saying. These grievances can be real or imagined. They may have no basis in reality, but if they have put that victim hat on and believe it, they can act on that, even though it's not consensual. Absolutely. You, you just put that perfectly. And that's exactly what's happening. And that's what explains a lot of what we see in the world, in the universe of conspiracy theory and things where half or more of the population doesn't even understand uh, what the grievance is in the other half of the, of the population. Uh, and one, one group firmly believes uh, that there is either a dramatic threat or there's been a dramatic wrong that's been perpetrated. And they're carrying that as a grievance. And, it, and logic no longer, or I would say, let's talk about it as terms of evidence. Evidence, real world evidence doesn't matter anymore. It's not persuasive for that person because they believe 
that there is a legitimate grievance that they have. And now that this revenge craving addictive process has begun in their minds and we're, you know, the train has left the station in terms of logical persuasion. Now we have to go in and the process that we've developed is to work with an individual like this. And we say, let's allow you to try out that entire case inside your own head. We created a, uh, a courtroom of the mind where the uh, where it's it's guided and directed toward a verdict, and we allow the person to experience getting revenge or getting justice safely inside their head before they carry it out in real life. Think of methadone for a justice addict for a moment. That's how we think of it. And when we use this process, we release the revenge craving, the violence craving safely, and allow this person to move beyond it and then come back to us again and consider even the idea of forgiveness, which is, of course, ultimately going to be the resolution of any grievance from the end of World War II to any act of terrorism where the terrorist group finally puts down its weapons to a dispute between a husband and a wife or two children on a playground. Ultimately, the only thing that resolves a grievance and restores peace, happiness, and health is a decision to forgive. And this non-justice process that we've developed is a way of actually systematizing that rather than the current, you know, government run justice system, which systematizes revenge seeking. It does not systematize healing and revenge.